Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Till Mets Do Us Part here, courtesy of the Chop Sports Network. And of course, you can get this podcast wherever it is you listen to your podcast. It doesn't matter to us, whether it's Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, all of those places and more. You can find us if you search Till Mets Do Us Part. We don't care where you listen. We just care that you listen. And speaking of, if you want to watch us, if you want to check us out as we do this podcast, you can do that now too over on our YouTube channel, which is appropriately named Till Mets Do His Part as well. The episodes usually drop at the same time unless YouTube is screwing things up, which sometimes happens. Sometimes but, you know, happens. I promise all the episodes will be there. Uh, regardless, this is John Safanaro out in sunny Los Angeles, California. As always, my co-host back in New Jersey, Matt Ibby Ibanez. Ibby, I know this is a loaded question because we're recording – Two seconds after the Mets lost a heartbreaker, <laughs> but how are you feeling? <laughs> I've been better, John. Uh, you know, besides obviously the Met loss, uh, started another job for the summer since school's over. So I'm outside working in the sun all day, running around with kids. So that drains you a little bit. So I come home, I think, oh, I'll watch the Mets and then I got to watch how that game friggin' ends. But eating either. Regardless, it doesn't matter. It's Wednesday, which, which which means we get to hit record, and I'm excited as always because I get to see your you know your beautiful face, John. But also <laughs> the fact that it's another week and we have yet another awesome guest. I'm gonna throw it back to you, John. Let's intro him. Let's get into today's conversation. I'm I'm very excited for this guest. I I have been since we booked him. Uh, thanks to Jay Horowitz for making it happen. Friend of the show, obviously. Uh, if you Jay. missed the episode with Jay Horowitz, you can go back and listen to it. It was before we had our YouTube channel, but I promise you can find it on any of the podcast platforms. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so excited to talk to this guy, especially in light of what just happened and what is on the horizon for the Mets in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. Former pitcher for the Mets from 1980 to 1986. Former GM for the Chicago Cubs. That is the one and only ed lynch ed thank you so much for being here how you feeling i'm feeling good john thanks for having me absolutely look ed, ed i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it up to you in which direction we go as our esteemed guest because when i talked to you yesterday i said look i want to talk about some of the cool stuff that the mets have coming up that's long overdue uh the retirement of keith hernandez's number and also the old timers day returning of old timers day but I said we could talk a little bit about what's going on with the Mets so far this season. So what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about the team on the field? Do you want to talk about the exciting stuff off the field? How do you want to start? Well, we'll start with the off the field stuff. I'll tell you, there's a new feeling around the club now. I mean, there's a feeling that the guys that used to play for the Mets are valued higher now than they yes. were in the past for whatever reason. But, I mean, just the fact that, you know, Steve Cohen – Sandy Alderson, Billy Epler, you know, there's just the fact that they're having this retirement of Keith's number, Tom Seaver's statue, which was so far overdue, I can't even begin to describe how overdue that was. And, uh, you know, the old timers day, I mean, to have these kind of functions, these are, you know, I grew up a Met fan living in New York. So I remember old timers day. And uh, there was a feeling of inclusion then of, of all the former players, even the team that lost 120 games in 62. Those guys were still looked upon as like icons. Okay. Now, some of them had, you know, careers before there are Gil Hodges and those guys. But, you know, there's a feeling of inclusion now. And, you know, I really am excited about the direction the Mets are, are heading, not only on the field, but off the field. Yeah, I, I could totally agree with that. And look, Obviously, you and Keith are, are friends. You've been friends a long time. I know you must be so excited for him to have this honor that is long overdue. I'm not sure if you guys can see behind me, but that is my framed autographed Keith Hernandez jersey <laughs> that's been on my wall for a while. Um, and then you're going to be there at Old Timers Day. So was your relationship with the Mets or your rekindling of the relationship, did that happen recently? Or, or have you been kind of involved with the organization since you since you left You know, working in baseball with the Cubs uh, back in 2000? No, it's been very recent. I really did not have a relationship with the Mets since I was the assistant GM there in 94. Mm -hmm. And then I left to become the general manager of the Cubs. I've had no relationship whatsoever with the official Mets organization. Now, there are outside entities that do card shows and things of that nature. I've been involved with those, but nothing that was Mets sponsored. Not many of us at all, really. I've talked to a lot of my teammates from the 80s, and there really wasn't a lot of you know, inclusion and, and functions. and But the generosity of Steve Cohen and, and uh, the thoughtfulness of Sandy Alderson and, you know, and their PR staff and their marketing staff, I think it's, it's, great, what's, it's great what's going on right now. And, and the fans want to see it. 
They absolutely do. And Ibby, just from a from a fan's perspective, I mean, look, yeah. this is something you and I started this show shortly after the Steve Car- Cohen o- uh, era got underway. Right. And so we've always waxed poetic about how good, how, how excited we were for the, the potential change in tone. And that tone has shifted. But now we hear it from Ed and we've heard it from people like Turk Wendell who have been on this show, Glendon Rush. I mean, the list yeah. goes on and on of the people who say, this is just a different organization. Even Jay Horowitz said it himself. And Jay He's been with the team for 45 years. And so to hear Ed say something like that, it really validates what we feel as fans, right? A hundred percent. And it's just, I, I said this episodes ago when we were talking about it, it's like, no matter what, it didn't matter. And Ed just kind of mentioned it before as well. It doesn't matter what was going on with the teams because no matter what, even if it was a bad team, like I said, they lose 120 plus games. Like it didn't matter. Like those players still held something to us because they were our team. They are it's part of our franchise that we that we you know grown to love. And now that we finally have something where they are getting the respect, it's again. I, I've said this multiple times, and I I believe it to be true. We finally have someone who actually loves the New York Mets when we had previous ownership that did not love the New York Mets, which is insane to say because they were the owners of the New York Mets. But it, it, but it, it speaks volumes when you hear this coming from a former player and other players as well. They're saying, Hey, they're reaching out to me now. They want to know what's going on. They want me to join this. They want, they want to hear my thoughts on this, like whatever it may be. The fact that there is a, uh, an appreciation for those that came before, I think is, is, yet another step forward in why this team is finally becoming a well-run franchise. Very well and, said, man. I couldn't agree more. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and Ed, for you, I, I don't know if it, it's possible for you to do this because you've you've been a part of, baseball's been a part of your life for such a long time, but if you could separate your, your time as a player, your time as an executive with the Mets, with other teams, your time as a coach, it, you said earlier you grew up a Mets fan. You're from Brooklyn, so am I, by the way. Um, but as as a fan, somebody who grew up as a Mets fan, do you also feel a certain sort of pride and connection now to the past? As if you could separate your your playing days and your days in, as an executive as well. Oh yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that the current regime has shown the respect that I think those clubs in the 80s truly deserve. And, you know, there were some great players and some characters some great personalities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And why you wouldn't tap into that and display them for your fans uh, is hard to understand, but they're doing it now. And I think it's just great. And, and uh, again, I, you know, even, you know, to go on to on the field, you know, mm-hmm. they went out and got the best manager that was available. No doubt in my mind, this guy, what is he's a he's a, a computer you know in his mind i mean this guy handles bullpens better than any manager in baseball he understands players mentality you know i think the mets are very smart i think sandy alderson and billy epler and Bryn alderson the head of pro scouting i think they're looking at the uh analytics which everybody should mm-hmm. but they're getting players with some heart and soul players like you know uh, Nemo and McNeil and Alonzo and those kind of guys. And those, what you, you win with players, you don't win with numbers. Yeah. I, I, incredibly well said. Ibby and I yes. have been talking about it basically since the start of the season, how, you know, the Mets are not only good this year on the field, but they are trending towards being a top five organization in baseball yes. in terms of the way that they're run from the uh, owner all the way down through the front office, through the coaching staff, Buck Showalter at the helm. And and that to me, Ed, is kind of the most refreshing thing about it because the Mets have always had boom and bust success over their entire franchise history. And that's why it's kind of crazy that they weren't honoring the 86 team as a franchise, as an organization, because that's the last time we were any good were the late 80s. You know, I know we had that brief kind of stretch in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. We couldn't quite get over the hump again in 2015. But, you know, again, you as a, as a former executive, when, when you look at, at some of the things that they're doing, do you say with, with confidence that this could be, like I said, potentially going forward, a top five organization in baseball? There's absolutely no doubt. I mean, there, what is the reason? There is no physical reason why the New York Mets are not on par with the New York Yankees year after year after year. It's the same market. It's the same revenue capabilities, same revenue potential. And what it takes, the key word in this whole thing is resources. Mm-hmm. Now they have the resources and they have a guy who's willing to spend them. And that's what they've done across town forever. Right. Yep. And, and the Mets are going to be in a position where they are 
going to be a New York Yankees type dominant team in the National League year after year after year. There's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't happen. Yeah, I, I, 100%. very, very well said, Ibby. Yeah. You know, and and to his point. I think the Mets are the closest second team in New York. You know, depending mm-hmm. on how you slice it, it's either 60-40 in favor of the Yankees. Maybe it's 55-45. But, mm-hmm. you know, and the, the Jets and Giants are probably the next closest franchise. But, you know, the Mets are right there. I mean, in the 80s, it New York was a Mets was town. A town. I mean, we, yeah. can, we can bounce this back to Ed in, in a moment because he yeah. lived it. But, you know, it'd be, he's 100% right from a fan perspective, a support perspective. If this team is consistently excellent, more and more fans will come out of the woodwork. Absolutely. You yeah, know, absolutely. New York was yeah. a National League town for so many years. I mean, the Yankees have always been there. But, you know, they had the, the, you know, the Dodgers and the Giants and, and, you know, the Mets should, and they do own Long Island. They got to own Brooklyn. They got to own Queens. You know, we'll give the Yankees parts of New Jersey. But, you know. <laughs> but just not, right. just I mean, not in these neighborhood. Yeah. Not my neighborhood. No, <laughs> not that's my right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful stadium mm-hmm. and, a, and a really perfect spot for people to reach. Um, it's easy to take a family to City Field. I'm not dis- disparaging, you know, the South Bronx or Yankee Stadium, but you know, we're I think the Mets should be okay. very proud of the, the ballpark they built and yeah. how safe it is and clean. And you know, it's just a great place to watch a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and Ibby, again, just just from a fan's perspective and just reacting to everything I just said for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a hundred percent, and like you said, just it, it really comes back to the resources. For the longest time, this team was was run as a mid to low market team, and we've we've had conversations about this in the past. There's no such thing as a as a you know as a poor team because these are run by billionaires. They all have money; they're just choosing not to spend it. But yeah, the resources are fine there, and you have somebody that actually cares. And no matter what, moving forward, this team is going to have a product not only on the field but also within the front office, within the low minors. I mean, we've seen things put out from The Athletic talking about how Steve Cohen is spearheading things about making uh, living conditions better for for minor leaguers, which has always been an issue uh, throughout baseball, not just for the Mets, but throughout baseball. So he's doing a lot of good, and it's, again, it comes back to the one word that I've been saying at nauseum, and that's just I've always wanted, and you as well, John, we've wanted sustainability and something that carries over from year to year. So we're not always so much, you know, so much so, okay, we're good this year, and then we're down for the next three years. And then it's like, oh, we have a shot here, maybe. And then, oh, if we make a move, but we won't make a move because we don't have the money. That's not the case anymore. We have resources. We have money to put players on the field. We have a lot of excitement in the low minors, as well as our, you know, that uh, minors that are players that could be coming up this year to help us. So there's a lot of excitement and there should be, and I think there's going to be a lot going forward as well. I, I do too. Ed, let me ask you from a, from a, a former executive in baseball perspective. Now I'm, I'm sure you're kind of, uh, maybe even a little split on this because you were a player. You're the only uh, former player and former executive that we've had on the show so far. And mm-hmm. during the lockout, we talked to a lot of former players about how just certain teams in general wouldn't spend money and uh, certain owners cry poverty like Ibby was alluding to. You know, you could speak to it from a player perspective, but you can also speak to it as a as somebody who was in charge of player personnel, partially with the Mets as an assistant, and then obviously with the Cubs in the in the big chair. So, what's your thought on the way baseball has sort of become? Where look, there are certainly haves and have nots in terms of markets, but there's not really haves and have nots in terms of the people who own the teams and how deep their pockets are. Well, you know, I, I can't you. You shouldn't have to lose money to compete in this in baseball. You shouldn't say, well, you know, you're a billionaire. You should lose $50 million a year to compete. And that's just not right. It's un-American. Mm-hmm. And you shouldn't have to ask the Kansas City Royals to try to spend with the New York Yankees mm-hmm. because the Yankees' revenues probably are 50 times higher. Mm-hmm. And, you know, baseball is the only major sport without total revenue sharing and a hard salary cap. You know, do you think the Green Bay Packers could win the NFL championship or the Pittsburgh Penguins could win the Stanley Cup if there was no revenue sharing in those sports? It's imp- it'd be impossible. It'd be right. absolutely impossible. So, 
I do feel for some of the smaller market teams because it is very difficult and you shouldn't have to lose 50 to $100 million a year to compete. But if you're smart, like Tampa Bay has done a great job with limited yeah. revenues. And like what you what you guys said before, sustainability, it's so true. Look at the Kansas City Royals. You know, they lose in the seventh game and then they go out and win the World Series and then they can't sign any of their players. And now they have to go back into that trough again of, you know, trying to rebuild, start the process all over again. And that's very difficult for teams and it's very difficult for fans. So, um, but, you know, when you're when you have a free market um, industry like ours, basically is i know there's a luxury tax which attacks which is kind of a deterrent has to deter the dodgers or the yankees no, or the Red yeah. Sox, but you know it's there and you know but it does, it's really not effective it's never going to allow the kansas city royals or tampa bay rays to be on the same playing field financially with the yankees red Sox, dodgers so there are reasons why some teams don't spend as much and a lot of it is not greed it, it's it's just you're a businessman. You didn't become a billionaire by losing money, right? Which which is a f- a fair take, honestly. And yeah. again, from somebody who sat in the chair making player personnel moves for a major league team for a long time, uh, it's not a perspective that we've seen so far. And I'm sure you empathize with the players. Look, you baseball careers, sports careers in general are short and you have a small amount of time to make as much money as you possibly can when you've devoted your whole life to it to that point. So let me just ask you this way then. what I know the lockout's behind us. There's a new collective bargaining agreement. It's probably not a conversation for today, but you're on with us today. So what would you be in favor of? What what would you uh, think would work to kind of level out the playing field a little bit? There's a lot of things that you mentioned. There's things that get bounced around. Salary caps, salary floors, a less punitive luxury tax, a more punitive tax. Like what what would be some of some of your ideas? I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you know, if you just rattle off a few. Well, I mean, I, it's easy to play Bob Costas. You know, I mean, it's easy to be a genius. <laughs> say, you know, we ought to have a hard salary cap and total. Revenue sharing, you feel like right. saying, Hey, Bob, did you run that by the union yet? Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the process you know, here. The baseball union is the most powerful union in professional sports. Mm-hmm. I can't think of another union that's close. And to do the things that are going to, that the NFL has done, that the NHL has done, you know, it, it's just going to be very difficult to do that in a labor atmosphere that exists now. And, right. but you know, it is what it is, but one of the things you could do, what I, I would do, the teams that intentionally tank to get high draft picks, which I think is very silly. We're not talking about the NFL or the NBA draft where you can say, well, there's LeBron James, let's take him right. first. Well, you're dealing with high school and college players. So, you know, uh, Ken Griffey Jr. was the first one, one to ever make the hall of fame first mm-hmm. round, first player picked. So you're not guaranteed success if you get the first pick in the country every year. Now, you're going to get a pretty good player, no doubt. But, you know, the lower parts of the first round, second round, third round are full of guys that are going to get to the Hall of Fame eventually. So it it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if player uh, teams are going to do it, I would just institute a lottery. I would try to just, Mm -hmm. you know, take that incentive away, have the bottom five pick out of a hat like the NBA has done and just take away that incentive to intentionally tank. I, I mean, I agree with you. I, Ibby, you look yeah. no further from the team, and it kind of combines a lot of what Ed was just saying. The team that just beat the Mets, you know, and swept the Mets both times yeah. in the last two weeks, the Astros, they were the ones who made that work. They went into yes. the tank for three or four seasons, and they lost over 100 games. I think they lost 120 games. This is they lost like over number. yeah, like 350 games in three years. It was ridiculous. Absolutely insane yeah. number, exactly. But they made it work for the most yeah. part. I think there was one draft pick they didn't hit on, which was the pitcher everybody else it was like boom boom well, just boom. debuted didn't he yeah didn't mark Appel just come up for, oh yeah for, for, I, think for so. I think i think he just came up at, at the age of 30 he finally at, made it yeah at the age of 30 but so yeah. so how do you how do you feel because it's something that during the lockout you and i never really talked about the lottery system do you mm-hmm. think that would work for you as a fan like how would you feel about that i mean i i i get that i get the take because again you you don't want to watch these teams just blatantly go out there, cry poor, 
then basically trade everyone away. Like, and you're seeing it now when you're seeing people like Oakland who's selling off on everybody. You're seeing Cincinnati who's selling off everybody. And they're basically saying, well, we don't have anything. No one's coming to watch these games. So we're just going to give everyone away, get some, get some players back, better our farm system. And then we're going to then really clean up in the, in the upcoming draft because we're going to have so many picks and so many early picks. So, I mean, that thought process, I think it's, I think it's bad baseball and it's in bad faith because not only are you not giving anything to the people that are willing to watch your product, but now you're basically saying that, you know, this is my way of getting around the system that's in place. And I'm, and it worked for Houston. It's worked for, you know, Tampa Bay, like early on when they were like really, really bad, but then it worked for the Cubs too. It, they it, lost a hundred games two years in a row. Right. It, it, it works for the Cubs there. So, you know, it's, it's, Something has to be done in terms of just leveling the playing field to to the point where you know you're not seeing teams like 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 I just said Cincinnati. Or I, I wouldn't even say Cincinnati because they've played a, a little bit better as opposed to the way they started. But the fact that a team like Oakland, who is basically saying, "Hey, it's open season over here. We're just going to keep on losing games." Hey, you want Frankie Montas? Hey, you want you want you know Matt Olson? Here, here's Matt Olson. Matt Chapman. Here you go. Like th- these are really good players, and they're just giving them away, and they're like. The, the thought process on winning is not there when the name of the game is trying to win the World Series in the end. Like you, you want to win, but these teams they don't want to. So implementing something like a lottery, even though I'm not that big on it, like in terms of the NBA, maybe maybe it would be a little bit different for for baseball. I'm not sure, but I, I I'm with I'm with it because the idea of just something different to see how it plays out is something that I'm willing I'm willing to roll with. I think you're right. I, I think you need something different. I think yeah. I think that's kind of the point is that where we've been, it, it's kind of not working. And I maybe we maybe we pushed it and inched it with this last CBA a little bit closer. But I, I really feel like we didn't get to where we needed to go. And, and look, and I know this is a, a a Mets podcast, but you know, Ibby brought up the Oakland A's. It, it is such an interesting case because it was a good team last year. And Very I know good. it's it's yeah. this the cycle that happens with these smaller market teams is you want to get rid of some of these players when they still have uh, extra value on, in terms yeah. of control. And that's what they did with Chapman. I mean, obviously Bassett to the Mets. He's in the last year of his deal. But, you know, uh, they were able to unload Olsen. It's a strange situation to see out there because – from a fan's perspective, you understand why there's only 2,000 people showing up. I mean, it's a team. I, would they win 88 games last year? And now they're yeah. they're they're punting this year. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, again, from somebody who sat in the GM chair, I, Billy Bean is it, it's so tough for sticking it out up there, man. God bless him. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of it's a ballpark issue, though. Know? It's almost impossible too, to get yeah. a publicly funded stadium anywhere in the state of California. I mean, they, they, they lost the 49ers, for Christ's sakes. They would have yeah. lost the Giants if that Tampa Bay thing had gone through because that's a privately funded stadium. I call it the house that Barry built because yeah. Barry built that stadium. That, that was private money. And when, you know, when they built that stadium, all their focus was on winning at the big league level to pay that nut every month on the stadium. And mm-hmm. – Barry Bonds, he was the guy. He drove the engine, and he was the engine that drove the, the boat, and and they paid off the stadium, or they're close to paying it off. So, you know, Oakland, I, I've been to that stadium a hundred times scouting, and it's 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 a tough place. It's a tough venue. And to get a stadium built in California with the fiscal issues and the environmental issues, it's it's virtually impossible. So I feel for them in that regard. It really has nothing to do with their ability to evaluate and put a quality product on the field. A lot of it is the venue they're playing in and the the inability or the unwillingness of the government to help them build a new stadium, which would make a huge difference. I think it would, especially now that the the Raiders have left. I mean, that place was always better for football than it was for baseball. I've been there for both. And, you know, I mean, you've got – a team in running deep into the playoffs and they've got entire sections covered because you know, they're no matter how good they are, they're not going to sell 80,000 seats or it's whatever big, yeah. that, you know, that it's built for. So let me, let me just ask you from a, from a curious standpoint, you know, the, the A's are a, a, a longstanding franchise in Oakland. Obviously they didn't start there, but they've been there for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And do, do you think the solution is ultimately that they're going to move to another city, uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, either wind up in Vegas right. or one of the other expansion markets that they're talking about? That's certainly a, a possibility. And, 
I, I could see, I guarantee you the owner has been looking into that possibility. I mean, and look at, he's probably looking at a guy, I, if I'm not pronouncing his name correctly, Cronky took the, the, takes the St. Louis Rams Cronky, into yeah. LA. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of revenue they generated, they, you know, they win the Super Bowl, obviously, but mm -hmm. that was the greatest move any team's ever made since the LA Dodgers in terms of increase in, in visibility and revenue stream, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the owner of the A's is looking at that saying, geez, if we can go to Nashville or we can go to Charlotte or we can go somewhere, you know, new and exciting, you know, there'll be that honeymoon period. Give us a mm -hmm. shot in the arm financially. Then we can do the baseball thing. So we've done well with nothing. So, right. you know, I feel for him. I really do. Let, let me ask you this. This is a, a little bit of a strange question, only because you mentioned markets like Nashville and Charlotte. And again, your time as an executive, your time as a scout, you've been to these places for winter meetings. You've been to these places to visit minor league parks. Is there one, you know, they mentioned Nashville. They have mentioned Charlotte. They've mentioned Portland, maybe another team somewhere in Texas. They've mentioned giving Montreal a team back. Mm -hmm. Is If you could pick one destination that you think would work, whether it's moving a team like the A's or the Rays there, or just starting a new franchise is there one that jumps out to you ed is like wow this this would be the place and it's okay if it's a revisit like montreal well i think you have to look at you know the economies and the uh you know the tax laws in the state in the states that are vying for these clubs i mean it'd be very difficult to put a team in you know one of these uh high tax uh states most of them have teams already but you know, look where the growth in population is. It's going south and it's going west. You know, mm -hmm. certainly Texas could handle another team, I think, if it's in the right spot. Uh, Tennessee, Nashville, North Carolina. I mean, these are quickly, fat, vast, vastly growing business environments that are booming population, uh, tax revenue. They're willing to spend for the entertainment they want. Uh, those, I think it's more of an analysis of the, the, the tax laws and the business environment as to whether these are going to work or not. And from what I've seen, Nashville is absolutely booming, you know, yeah. real estate wise, tax revenue wise, Charlotte is booming. Uh, so I think those are possibilities. I think you want to go to a market that is growing substantially rather than staying static or, or reducing in population. I, I, I could agree with that. Andy, I just got back. Yeah. I just got back from Nashville last weekend. As a matter of fact, I was there mm -hmm. for work and uh, it's the fifth, maybe fifth time, sixth time I've been to Nashville and, and it's always been, look, it's music city. And so it, it has this kind of heartbeat, but mm -hmm. every time I go back, cause it's usually a year or two in between every time I go back, it's bigger, it's noticeably bigger. And you know, this past time I was there, Ed, like it's, it's been, probably two and a half years since I was there. And, and again, you just see it. You you see the growth. It's tangible from the outside looking in. And, you know, Ibby, they're very centrally located. They're yeah. kind of in an area that's easy to get to from five, six surrounding states. But at the same time, you know, they don't have a team right there. So they kind of just gravitate towards the Braves. You mm -hmm. know, they've got the Tennessee Titans, obviously. But I think Nashville makes a ton of sense. Plus, you know, Tennessee's a, it's a big, big, big from Vanderbilt on, you know, down to lower levels in high school. It's a big baseball city. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I think everything Ed was saying about about how everything down south is booming. So I, I was I was gonna say like uh, Nashville and Tennessee, like I, I feel like it just, it's proper because I, I everything you were just saying, John, but also you know, like you see things on social media, you see things, you see people posting everything, like everyone's going to Nashville, everyone's checking it, everyone wants to go there because they're hearing the same things that you're saying, like let's go check this, I want to go here, it's so like the idea of putting a team there. I think in turn, when you're having a lot of traffic coming into the state, it kind of says, hey, let me go check out the Tennessee or Nashville, whatever their name's going to be. And then let me see what's going on there. And then maybe you're going to start building some fans, which I know baseball has a hard time doing with, you know, bringing in new fans or I suppose just holding on to the old fan. But yeah, I, I think the idea of putting something in a very uh, booming type of area is the smart move as opposed to saying, well, let's see what when, when I think you know, baseball, I think more so a different place as opposed to putting it there. So wherever there are, uh, you know, a, a large glut of people, let's try and go there and let's try and build some. So I, I love the idea of Nashville. I do. Well, plus you've got a lot of 
uh, Northeasterners, a lot of New Yorkers. You know what they call New Yorkers down there? They call them halfbacks. They went down to Florida and only made it halfway back. <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard that before. That's a good you one. Got a, you got a ton of Yankee fans. You got a ton of Met fans. You got yeah. Red Sox fans, Philly fans. I mean, there's an exodus out of the Northeast into these areas like Nashville. And so, yeah. you know, you're down there, you're 40, you're 35 years old. You got a 12 year old son, you know, you're a big Met fan. Hey, let's go out and watch the Nashville sound or whatever they got, whatever they call yeah. it. And, you know, that's what builds tradition. You know, when I was right. 12 years old, we moved from New York to Miami, Florida. And I went out to a Dolphin game in 1968, and they were terrible. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. this is brutal. You know, I was a Jet <laughs> fan. I was a Met fan. I was a Nick fan. We leave New York, and all three of those teams win the World Championship the next year in 69. Yeah. So, but we became Dolphin fans as I was in high, my senior year in high school. They were undefeated. So how do you not root for that team in your backyard? Right. So you'll, you're not creating new baseball fans, but you're creating new Nashville fans or new Charlotte yeah. fans. And that's how it happens, you know? And I remember rooting for the Dolphins when they're playing the Jets and all those AFC championship games. I didn't feel guilty. I'm, a, you know, I'm living Miami now, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> As a as a Jet fan, uh, and I'm personally offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I, I went to Super Bowl three. I was in the upper oh, deck. In the oh, that's zone. awesome. I have a ticket stub, $10, upper deck, end zone. Oh, wow. you can, yeah, it's, it's only bucks. a little bit more wow. expensive to get to the Super Bowl nowadays. Plus I have the, I have the uh, program from that game, and every single ad in there is cigarettes, liquor, cars or those tv sets we had when i was a kid that were about eight feet long and weighed seven tons with a turntable on top you know that was <laughs> that's what your tv looked like back then so but that wow. those are great memories but you know yeah. my point is i mean there's an awful lot of baseball fans in these places mm -hmm. and you know miami my hometown they talk oh you know baseball fans baseball fans but they're you know you have so many people coming from south america and different places that baseball is, you know, they're more soccer fans than they are baseball. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to have a heck of a lot more people coming into Nashville as baseball fans than you will say in Southern Texas or in, in, in places like Miami. Yeah, no, it, it, yeah. it makes total sense. Nashville's a, a really good spot. It, it's one that I've kicked around before uh, in my head, and I'm just I'm happy that you brought it up. This has been a great conversation, so much so that mm -hmm. I almost don't want to take a pause, but we're a little <laughs> bit over the halfway mark, so we do have to take a break to get some ads in here and all that fun stuff. So uh, we'll be right back, and then we'll turn the attention over to Old Timers Day, Keith Hernandez, all that great stuff coming up. With our guest, Ed Lynch, this is John Sapinaro, Matt Ibi Ibanez. Till Mets do his part, we will be right back. Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back into Till Mets do his part here on the Chop Sports Network. And like I say at the top and at the return from every single episode, you can get this podcast wherever it is you listen to your podcast. You can find us across the board if you just go ahead and search Till Mets do his part. It is all courtesy of the Chop Sports Network. John Sapinaro, Matt Ibi Ibanez, and our guest this week, former Mets pitcher Ed Lynch. Ed, what else? What, what else do you have going on? Is there anything else you want to you plug, talk about before we get back into the Mets specific conversation with? some of the other things going on yeah i mean there's a great uh, entity out there for any met fan that wants to really immerse themselves in the met culture and it's the met fantasy camp i mean i i was invited last year for the first time which was uh a pleasant surprise and i think that goes along with the new <laughs> feeling the new right. feeling uh in the in the organization of embracing former players and it was great it was down there for a week i mean i was with howard johnson and mookie wilson and you know, uh, Dwight Gooden was there. I mean, it, it was just, it was a lot of fun. And I think they're absolutely sold out. It's in November at Port St. Lucie, but I would, if I was a Met fan, a serious Met fan, it's a great week down there. They have two weeks down there. It's a lot of fun. It's it's just a great experience. So I would encourage anybody to try to get in in November of 2022, but I don't think it's going to be possible, but I would certainly get my money down for 2023 if I could. I, I mean, that's, that's, awesome. that's fantastic. I, I wasn't yeah. sure you were going to take it in that direction. You know, I said like, ah, <laughs> you know, non met centric stuff. And it was, it was, it was more Met stuff, but that's good. I've yeah, never been to awesome. one. Maybe I, I, I know never a have. people who yeah. have that love it. And I've my never one buddy to went, one. my one buddy went and tell me he, it was, it was an absolute blast. He was like, and he says, make it a bucket list thing at some point, try to do it. And I was just like, I, I definitely would love to try something like that and, and to do it. But he told me well, he had you, so much fun with it. If you don't tear your hamstring in half, it's a lot of fun. 
<laughs> you know, all the most, 90% of the injuries are leg injuries. So if you're going to go course. get your legs in shape, because a lot of guys go out and swing the bat and throw the ball, then the first ground ball, they got to run it out. <laughs> Bam! There they go. <laughs> what a what a bummer that must be, Ed. You know, you you, you oh pay God. the money, you get the, the ticket. Money. He's calling. Amy's saying it's a bucket list thing. You're saying you gotta go. You yeah. finally go down there. The first ball you hit, you decide I'm gonna bust it out of the box like I'm 22 years old, and then you feel that pop grab in the back of your head. You go. oh That's yeah, gotta I've be. Seen that. I've seen that a dozen times in my 20 year oh. old fantasy game. <laughs> Oh my God, that's oh, brutal. Man. That is a, that just sounds so sad for that person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. It's not funny at all. That sucks, no, but, but it's still. just it, it sounds absolutely brutal. Yeah, I, I'm gonna try to get down at some point. Um, I don't know when I'll be able to do it, but I would love to do it. Uh, a few of my buddies out here in LA have been to the uh fantasy camp for the Dodgers and, and stuff like that. And they, they just say what a great experience it is if you're a baseball fan across the board. So uh that's good stuff, and it, and it's nice to know, you know, kind of bookends the way you open things up and like it's it's nice to know that again you've been invited back you said it was a pleasant surprise and it really speaks volumes to everything that the organization has been doing to really pay homage to their their uh the previous generation so with that said let's talk a little bit about old timers day you're going to be able to uh take part take part in that coming up i think it's august 23rd how excited are you to be back on the field with the mets with former teammates and stuff Oh, that's going to be just great because I remember all the uh, the um, uh, old timers game when I was a player. And I what I did was I was a big baseball trivia guy. I, my dad got me a baseball encyclopedia when I was young. And so I, I made a point of getting autographs. So I would go there as a Met player with my baseball encyclopedia and I would walk around and get autographs. They'd sign their their little section in the baseball encyclopedia. And it was great, you know, because every single player in the big leagues or 99.9 percent .9 of them were baseball fans when they were kids. Yeah. So when they come out, I guarantee if Pete Alonso is going to go out there and see a Met that he liked, or McNeil, or you know some of these guys are going to go out there and say, "Hey, I was a big fan of you when you know growing up." Scherzer, yeah. obviously, or Degrom. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in the minor leagues, I looked up to you and things of that nature. So uh, it's a great event, any way you look at it. And I volunteered to pitch to one hitter. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in there. I'm going to get Daryl Strawberry. I'm going to say, Straw, man, I want you to hit off me. I'm going to throw you a nothing high cutter, belt high, middle in, and I hope you hit it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. That's it's actually awesome. – it's August 27th. I misspoke. I said it was the 23rd. It's the 27th. Ed, uh, what, what kind of – what kind of getting in shape do you have to do? Like, when was the last time you pitched, you know, in, in any capacity? Like, do you still throw the ball around? Like, so how do you prepare for going in for old timers? They obviously you're, you're not playing a major league game and you, it, no. it, I, there's so much of it. That's muscle memory. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But how do you prepare for this? Well, I've thrown batting practice for years. My son, who is now 30 years old when he was in, you know, little league high school, he played professionally for two years um, I threw a lot of batting practice. And so yeah. my arm is fine. I, you know, I talk to guys my age who have thrown a couple thousand innings over the years and Hey, how's your arm? Hey, my arm's fine. It's just my knees are shot, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. but I will be in front of that rubber. I am not going to pitch from the rubber unless they make me, but they could, they're going to have a hard time making me. So <laughs> it's a lot easier from 50 feet than 60. I'm just yeah. going to tell straw. If you hit the ball up the middle, I'm going to charge the plate. <laughs> so, don't shoot the box. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So it'll, it'll, it'll be a it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's that's awesome. Well, it's it's funny. You know, it's funny you mentioned everybody's arm is fine, and the guy that I always think of when it comes to that is the guy probably most people think of, and it's Nolan Ryan. Obviously, yeah. bit of Mets ties there, but you know when he retired at like forty five or whatever, still throwing ninety four miles an Incredible. hour. Incredible. <laughs> He, he said he felt like he could pitch another five years, like as far as his arm was. He said his his reaction time was slower yes, and his yeah, ability yeah. to, you know, recover. be on the mound and compete at that level and recover yes. was really what yes. he lost. Is, is that something, you know, obviously he pitched for 20 some odd years, but is, is that is that also part of it? Is it just being just, you know, you you, you have this want to as an athlete, but you just can't quite can't get it, do yeah. it anymore? Well, uh, God almighty just – threw a lightning bolt down and hit Nolan when he was born because, mm -hmm. you know, I pitched against Nolan in, in Shea Stadium in 1983. Uh, and he, I think he had a no-hitter in like the seventh inning. And I think Ron Hodges hit a little flare, but I got to hit off him twice. 
and I and I struck out twice. But one of the at bats, I think Ron Gardenhire hit in front of me, got a base hit, and I looked down there, and Bud Harrelson's giving me the the bunt sign. So I squared around, and the hardest pitch to bunt is a high fastball. Yeah. So I squared around the bunt, and I fouled that thing straight back into the green seats behind home plate. Yeah. That's how hard he was throwing. So I tell people, yeah, I took Nolan to the green seats one day. When I was <laughs> they in don't left field or they left field. I said, no, no, behind the plate. <laughs> They don't need to know. The direction is irrelevant. The bottom yeah. line is he went into the seats <laughs> off the bat of Ed Lynch. That's, That's what happened. That's but I remember great. looking out there. I mean, he's a big guy, but he's not that big. He's not like John Candelaria or somebody like that. And I looked mm -hmm. out there, and it looked like he was thrown from 40 feet. I mean, he's just such a presence on the mound mm -hmm. that it's just incredible. And I remember going back in the dugout and saying, how does anybody hit that? You know, yeah. and, and a lot of guys don't. Right. But another funny sidebar on that game, I could not get Jose Cruz Sr. out. I just could not get him out. So I just said, screw it. I threw at him. That's what I used to do. If I couldn't get you out, I'm going to throw it. <laughs> but I, I didn't throw a ball up here by his head, but I had, a, no. I had a really good ability to throw a ball about an inch from your breastbone right here. Okay. And I, I'm not trying to hit you. I'm trying to hit a spot right in front of you. If I'm trying to hit you, I just throw it behind you because everybody right. does this. They turn. You know, they turn right. and it hits them in the back. So I knock him down, you know, look like a yard sale. His helmet's over here, his bat's over there, his <laughs> batting gloves are over here. And I get him out. And I go back in the dugout, and players are coming up to me going, what are you doing? And I said, what? And they point, and there's Nolan, and they're looking. Who am I going to get for that guy hitting oh. my best player? You know? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and that's the way Nolan was, man. He was a yeah. headhunter. He's, he's coming for you. He oh. was scary. Oh, man. And so I was like. Oh shit! I didn't even Boy. think of that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> luckily, they were like number two in the batting order, so I wasn't yeah. going to get up there for a while, you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, oh, no man. one, no one's a freak of nature, and you know, along those lines, I am just absolutely astounded at the number of injuries that pitchers have now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't know what. I think it starts when you're very young. I mean, when I was a kid, I got home from school. I came in. We had a we had a 12 inch black and white television. My sister's sitting there watching dark shadows or something, you know, we have no phone, you know, we have a phone on the wall, mm -hmm. no computers. So what do you do? You go outside. We're outside throwing all the time, throwing footballs, throwing basketballs, throwing rocks, throwing bottles. And we just constantly threw, threw, threw. And I think that's, that's part of it. I don't take anything away from today's player because if I was young today, I'd be on my phone. I'd be doing all the things that people do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these players, they'll go to the gym for two hours, work real hard, and then they'll go home and uh, and sit for or sleep for twenty the other twenty two hours, you know. And they don't play the other sports either. So right. I played basketball and baseball my whole life, and I think a lot of the and we didn't do a lot of weight training. I, I believe in weight training specific to position players and pitchers. I'd be very careful with pitchers. But there's something to be said for twisting and turning. And, you know, I went to summer camp and we played tetherball. We swam and we played soccer. And we played basketball. We played softball. We played everything. And so when your body's constantly moving, twisting, sprinting, stopping, I think there's less tendency to get injured. So I, I think mm -hmm. now it's build up muscle mass. Like you look at Gia, Giancarlo Stanton, mm -hmm. you look at a guy like that. I mean, I'm surprised he doesn't pull a hamstring or a ribcage muscle every time he swings a bat or runs to first base. You know, these guys are monstrous. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that, very fair point. Very fair point on all those guys. It's funny. We had um a few weeks ago, I guess a few months ago now, we had Anthony Recker on, former catcher for the Mets, and mm -hmm. does some stuff on MLB Network and SNY. And he was talking, we talked to him a lot about Jacob DeGrom. And, you know, Jacob DeGrom, everybody always praises his mechanics. He's not the type of guy, Ed, that is uh, fits the description that you just said. I mean, he's not overly built in any way, shape, or form, but he's not out of shape, certainly. He's just got this really great pitcher's body. And I know he's done some things that people have never really seen before. He's added, you know, a mile and a half average on his fastball every year for the past five years as he's gotten older. And he's a guy who played different positions, played different sports, wasn't a pitcher his whole life. But yet here we are now, and he's kind of been 
I don't want to say injury prone, but I guess we'll say it over the last, you know, two or three seasons. Well, banged he's up, had yeah. these weird, freaky injuries. And we were talking about it with Wrecker because he's a big biomechanics guy and he really couldn't place what it is that might be ailing Jacob deGrom with all these freak. I mean, you go back to last year, it's a non-injury injury, something that he just couldn't really pitch through. And I don't know. Is is look? Everybody says he's not a max effort guy, and his mechanics are fluid, and he's just out there. But it seems kind of unnatural to be able to gain that much velocity and do the kinds of things that Degrom was doing. So, as somebody who pitched with the stuff that we're talking about, is it? What do you think it is with Jacob Degrom over the last two years? Well, like any any important trend, it's usually eighteen reasons rather than one. You know, <laughs> number one, he was a college shortstop. You know, he didn't pitch the bulk of innings. He probably didn't pitch, you know, when he got into the minor leagues, you know, they limit your innings a lot, you know. And then you get to the big leagues and they limit your innings, limit your innings. Then met your second or third year, it's like, hey, here we go. You're off to the races. Here you go. Mm -hmm. You know, back in, in when I was pitching, you came to the big leagues. Here you go. Dwight Gooden mm -hmm. threw 191 innings when he was 18 in AAA, struck out 300 guys, comes to the big leagues, throws, what, 250? Strikes out 280. Second year comes out, throws another 250, 260, strikes out 260 guys. And now, and he's 20 years old. Yeah. You know? So DeGrom and then Dwight's stuff, you know, dropped off, obviously, like everybody mm -hmm. else. But, you know, when God created man, he didn't have throwing a baseball in mind. It's a very unnatural. Uh, very motion. Unnatural, yeah. It takes its toll on you. And DeGrom threw a, a ton of innings through a ton of sliders. Um, it almost takes a freak of nature to go out there and pitch, you know, a power pitcher. Now, you talk about a guy that, that doesn't look like an athlete. I pitched with one of the greatest pitchers of a generation, Greg Maddox, who looked like the guy that uh, does your taxes on April yeah. 15th. You know? <laughs> yeah. But he wasn't a power guy, and he had clean mechanics. And uh, he never – I don't think he was on the DL in his 23 years in the big leagues. So – but that's the exception, obviously. Right. You Remarkable. know, even Tom Seaver, you know, had times. And like in 74, he had a hip. Then he had a neck thing, you know. But, you know, it, it's hard to explain. I know I, you can analyze it all you want, and it's just hard to put a reason on why certain guys get hurt and other guys don't. You know, DeGrom obviously was a once-in-a-generation talent. And I, I still think he's coming back. Obviously, he's, he's mm -hmm. I think he's throwing now. And then you have Scherzer. Scherzer's another guy. He's a freak of nature. And both of those guys, if they walked into a room, you wouldn't think, wow, those guys are dominating one of the three major sports in the United States because they don't look that way. You know, right. if an NFL linebacker right. or LeBron James walks into a room, everybody goes, holy cow, look at these guys, you know. So a lot of it's mechanical. A lot of it's hereditary. Uh, why DeGrom is having the issues he does, I'm not as familiar with his injury history as I should be, but – it's 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 very hard to put a finger on. Okay, if he does this, then this won't happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's fair, Ibby. That's I mean, that's basically exactly what Wrecker said. And Wrecker's a guy who yeah, pretty much yeah that was very up on the type of things that Degrom does. So it, you know, it's it's it, it's funny hearing from somebody who's caught Degrom, somebody who's pitched in the major leagues, fans watching it, you and I that just go. I don't know. I don't know yeah. what's wrong with DeGrom. He comes back, he's yeah. lights out, and then he, he goes away, at, you know, and you're like, what happened to him? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. And well, I'll tell you what. The one thing that will help DeGrom more than anything else is the fact that the Mets signed Max Scherzer. Yeah. Because now he's on the DL, but when he comes back, he's a warrior. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. can tell you, people say, geez, what's the, why do people have put such a high value on a number one pitcher? And I can tell you because I lived it. When Dwight Gooden came up as a 19-year-old and certainly as a 20-year-old, when you're a lower rotation guy like myself, you see a guy like that go out there and you see what's possible. It's possible to go into Dodger Stadium and shut him out. It's possible. I've never had a teammate do that, so it can't be possible. But then a guy goes and does it. So if DeGrom is sitting there watching Scherzer, two guys on in the seventh inning of a one nothing game, he's got the lead, and, and out comes – you know, he comes in after the seventh. How do you feel? I'm going back out there. You know, I'm going back out there. That's Scherzer. Now, DeGrom's sitting and listening to that. And he's going to say, I want to be like Max. So I'm going to push it a little further because I want to, hey, we're all, we're all competitive people, you know, and we see that guy doing that. I think I'm a number one. 
So I'm going to do what the number one guy, a true number one, which DeGrom is, but Scherzer might be a little higher. He might be, you know, what a, a, a 0.5. He's not a two. Is he what? He's a half. A, you know, he's above a number one starter. Mm-hmm. And I see him do that. I know I can do it. So I'm going to try. Yeah, I'm that's, try. yeah, it's a great point, Ibby, because, you know, when when Scherzer signed the big deal with uh, Washington, the knock on him was. Scherzer pitches six innings. Scherzer right. doesn't pitch beyond the sixth inning. He didn't but hit that level yet, yeah. Yeah, if you're DeGrom and you look up at Scherzer, I mean, Scherzer is seven and a half years older than DeGrom and still pitching at this level, something like that, right? I think Scherzer's yeah. 37 and DeGrom's, oh, I guess he's maybe five years older than him. Probably probably four or five years, yeah, about yeah. that, yeah. Okay, yeah, so what, yeah, my, my math's a little off. I guess DeGrom's 30, closer to 33, yeah. So, 33, but still, yeah. you know, you're, you're looking at it and you're saying, I, I can do this at that level if I if I kind of if I kind of get right, you know. No, that's I, right. He, absolutely. You know, yeah. Scherzer's shown him what's possible. What it, he's shown him what's possible for Jacob Degrom, and it sounds silly, but that's the way we think, you know. If you're on a team with a, with uh, you know Mike Trout in his heyday, mm-hmm. you know you see him do things, and you you know you know in the back of your mind you can't do what he's doing, but it's possible to do it. So I'm going to work harder so I can maybe do some of the things he does well. Because that, that super talent, that once-in-a-generation talent, will just lift everybody else up on the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead, Abby. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to come in, and I was just going to say that um, I, I I think the thought process that Ed just put out is is what all of us as Mets fans want to see because we see that that bulldog mentality that Max has, and you want that – you like. Like, like you said, like w- when you bring a player like that, it's clearly it shows your attentions as a franchise of what you want to do. So the idea of Jake being next to that is awesome. And you want to see him doing those similar things so he can obviously have a career on towards the back end like Max is having. But the question that I bring up is I feel and I think Jake kind of feels this, too, because of you, you hear rumblings here now. What's true? What's not? Who knows? But I also feel that the Mets might also err on the side of caution when it comes to Jake, because I guess I'll say, cause he's theirs quote unquote. And Max is someone that has established like, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'm going to go out there. You're not taking the ball from me. You come out here. I'm going to tell you to leave, go back. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to, I'm going to do it my way. That's been established. That's who Max Scherzer is. And we all, every baseball fans love that for him because that is shows you how much of a badass he is on that, on that rubber. But when it comes to Jake, I feel that the Mets in general as a franchise are so kid gloves with him. And I think it's getting to the point where it's kind of maybe it's rubbing Jake a little bit the wrong way. That's me just looking through the lines. I have no I have no idea if that's even close to being true. But I, that's what I kind of feel. But I'm with you, Ed, in the idea of seeing a player do that. You sit there as a competitor because everyone Jake knows he's the best. He, I mean, he's not one that goes out there and like – boasts about it but he knows how good he is regardless of what he says obviously he wants to do those same things but i question if the mets as a franchise will let him do those things because they don't want him to get hurt again no i think at this point in his career um and let's face it the money he's making if he wants to go out there he's going out there Mm -hmm. they can't they won't try to stop him anymore uh but you know that's why i think he's a tough competitor and a tough guy and a great teammate. Everything I heard about him is super positive. So if he's got, if he's saying he's hurting, he's hurting. You know, yeah. it's not something he's making up. He's not jaking or trying to, you know, shirk his responsibilities. That's not the truth at all. I mean, I, I really believe that he's got some issues. And I think when he, and they're curable issues. Yeah. But from what I understand. And so, boy, to have the Mets the last, you know, the last 70 games or whatever, 75 games to have those two guys at the top of the rip, uh, rotation please, will, please. will be awesome. Yeah. And plus, if you get into the, you know, postseason, say you don't win the, you know, for some odd reason, you don't win the division and you're in a one game playoff. Boy, you have Scherzer or DeGrom out there. That's why I used to tell people, man, if they had the wild card in the mid 80s, the Mets probably would have won several World Series because you're in a one game playoff. Yeah, here comes Dwight Gooden. You got no chance. Yeah. <laughs> Dwight Gooden, Ron Darling, Sid Fernandez, Bobby Ojeda. You know, you had, and then with that bullpen, Roger McDowell and Jesse Orozco and, and its supporting cast out there, they would have been hell on wheels. You know, that's why. You know, the, the Braves won, I think, before last year, the Braves won 14 division titles of one World Series, and the 
Marlins won two World Series and no division titles. Right. You know? <laughs> that's, like that name. that's been the benefit of the wild card. And that's why I think the Mets will be very, very dangerous. Any way they enter the playoffs are going to be a very dangerous team to play. And no one's going to want to play them. One question I wanted to get in there real quick before we head towards the end here, uh, Ed, is you mentioned before about talking about how having a, a player at the top as as an ace that you brought up Dwight. Obviously, we're talking about Max and and Jake. I'm bringing it back because I have I have it here. I have to ask you. 1985. You're you're there. You're seeing what Doc is doing. What was it like being someone that is a pitcher and seeing him going out there once every fifth day to do what he did during that? He's like, I guess. From your from your perspective, like what oh, was that it was, like? It was ridiculous. I remember I remember sitting with uh, Mel Stolomeyer on the bench one day. He is, we're going into Chicago. The wind's howling straight out. Mm-hmm. So what does he do? I'll, I think I'll be a sinker ball pitcher today. Turns the ball around in his hand. He's throwing these ninety five mile an hour concrete blocks up there. <laughs> he goes nine innings, four hits, one run, one earned, one walk, three strikeouts. You know. And I said to Mel, I said, have you ever seen anything like that in your life? He goes, absolutely never, never seen anything like that. And Mel has seen a lot of good pitchers. Yeah. And then yeah. the next start, we're at home against the Pirates, four seamers, you know, nine innings, five hits, one run, one earned run, two walks, 14 strikeouts. So here's the old doc again, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I remember, you know, he would get guys looking. He would punch out hitters looking that I couldn't even dream of striking out, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, for some reason, during that year, I probably pitched – I want to say a whole bunch, more than 12 times the day after Dwight. Mm -hmm. So now you're up there looking at Dwight, and there, here I come out the next day throwing change-ups and breaking balls and pitches in here and sliders away and all that crap. And it was an effective one-two punch. But I remember sitting there charting, and he would strike out Tony Gwynn looking, and Tony wouldn't say a word. He'd just walk away. You know, if I struck out a guy like that looking, he'd be strangling the umpire because obviously it wasn't. (laughs) Obviously, it wasn't a strike if he took yeah, it yeah. from me, you know. <laughs> so it's just being in the presence of greatness, it, it makes you want to be great. It's right. it's a great, you know, feeling. It elevates your confidence. And, and to see a guy wearing the same uniform as you just dominate the league, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a great feeling. Yeah, that's listen, all, that's before, amazing. Yeah. We're, we we are running out of time. I hope that you can give us a, a couple more minutes just to talk about the last thing because we've talked so much about the team in the 80s. We've talked so much about greatness and leadership and competitiveness and the kind of competitors. And it, it brings me to Keith Hernandez. He's finally going to get his day on July 9th. It's 10 days away. His number is going up in the rafters where it absolutely belongs. He belongs in Cooperstown, but that's another conversation. Another conversation. Um, I know that I know that your friends, Ed, I know that you're going to be on hand. So just what's your thoughts about Keith finally getting his number retired with the New York Mets? Oh, I think it's just awesome. You know, it's funny. I was there the day he came over and he asked the clubhouse guy for number 37. And the guy says, I can't give it to you. Because that was his number with the Cardinals. Right. He goes, yeah. why? He says, Casey Stangle, you're a Met now, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know? <laughs> <laughs> he's had to take 17 ironically and now they're going to retire that number too but I, I tell people all the time the road to the championship in 86 I, I got traded halfway through the year but I saw that thing being built from day one I was mm-hmm. the only guy that was there the day I came up that was still there on the team in the mid uh, middle of the season in 86 but the road to the championship started on June 15 1983 when the Mets acquired Keith Hernandez for Rick Ownby and Neil Allen It really, you know, we had good players and we had young players coming. You know, uh, Daryl had come up in May, uh, you know, the month before, but he was a young kid. And it's hard to, like, dump that on a young kid playing right field to be your leader and lead you to the promised land. But Keith, he had done it. He had won. He had won batting titles. He had been an MVP. Uh, You know, he's not the most incredibly talented player you've ever seen, but he demanded – that you give your best effort and you do not make mental errors. Like if I didn't get a bunt down in a sacrifice situation, I'm walking back to the dugout. He's on the top step waiting for me. Yeah, he mm-hmm. did that with everybody. Yeah. What are you doing? You got to get that bunt down. If that costs us the game, that's brutal, you know? And, you're, you know, it gets you pissed off. But, you know, once you do the next day, you go down the cage and turn that machine up as high as it goes and start bunting again, you know? Yeah. I mean, he demanded perfection, and he, and he, but he – didn't demand anything of anybody that he wasn't willing to do himself. And that's a sign of a true leader. So I just can't say enough for what he brought, you know, before he got there, if we lost a close game, it'd be like, Hey, you know, 
you know, we tried our best. We gave it a good shot. Hey, where are we eating tonight? You know? Yeah. And after he got there, it was like a direct insult to your family if you lost a game. Yeah. I mean, it was someone walked up and bit slapped your mom. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that, I mean yeah. I'm not – I'm being a little facetious here, but oh, oh, yeah. that was the mentality. Losing teams, it's very comfortable to lose, and everybody likes you when you lose. Oh, we like the Mets. They're, they're a tough group. Yeah, you guys were 8-0 against them this year. Yeah, we love the Mets, you know. Mm. But when you start winning, you make a lot of enemies, you know, That's... and uh, and people don't like you as much. The fans do, but the other teams don't. So, and he didn't give a damn, and he just let us. He was our leader. He was our battle-hardened, on-the-field general. And and he was the guy that, that you know, got on you when you were struggling. And he's the guy that knew enough when you're or, – or got on you when you made a mental error or if you're struggling – he would come up and, you know, encourage you. He was just a, the perfect leader. He's a perfect guy for that club. I, I mean, incredibly well said. I think a lot of people yeah. who watch games now, like obviously the everybody in the booth is is so beloved, Gary, Keith, Ron, and they they are. I think they're truly the best booth in baseball. And But there's a lot of fans now who are, you know, in their 20s, you know, a decade younger than me and Ibby, and they're in their late mm-hmm. teens that, you know, they're like, oh, this – this guy, Keith, you know, he says some goofy things sometimes. He really knows yeah. baseball. But, you know, so to hear it from from people like you who played alongside him, to hear it from, you know, Jay Horowitz, who we had on the show, to hear it from uh, – we had Jeff Perlman on who wrote the yep. book about the 86 team, the bad guys I know won. Jeff. And, yeah, 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 I know Jeff very well. And he – you know, to hear it from people who either played with him – he played four in the case of Jay, you know, in, in a roundabout way, or people who chronicled that team like Jeff. I mean, you can't say enough about the competitor that he was and and the, you know, it, he deserves everything he's ever gotten. His his accolades are, are they speak for themselves. And, you know, look, it's always been a topic of conversation with with Met fans and, and with Cardinal fans too, that he, he deserves to be in Cooperstown. So I'm, I'm sure you agree with that, right? And oh, I mean, 100%, 100%. I, I check all the boxes. There are guys in there that weren't, the player, certainly the leader that he was, and their numbers aren't so overwhelming that they're in there. I'm not going to bring any names up. I'm not going to disparage a Hall of Famer. But Keith belongs in there as much as anybody. So I just hope he can make it happen. I, I do too. I, I'm hoping that there's that. I'm hoping you know, that. What, what's the what's the thing called now? It'd be the, the he's he's up for. It's like the it's like so, the final committee. It's like yeah. the, way, the way Harold Baines got in and, and right, right, I, whatever it's and, called, Legends yeah. Committee. I have no idea. Legends but Committee yeah. or, or whatever. whatever Keith is. Hernandez has got to be. Yes, got to be on the be. list. Uh, Ed, bef- before we before we let you go, I'm put you on the spot just just to drop, and I, I don't want to get you know nothing nothing too crazy or anything like that. But uh, we 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 had Glendon Rush on, and and he gave us a really great Turk Wendell story about how you know Turk was such an enigmatic character. Do you have? We're talking about Keith Hernandez. Do you have a favorite Keith Hernandez story from your time playing with him? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but. Well, I mean, he was so into the games and so energetic, and, uh, you know, he was really into the game. So I remember one time I'm pitching against, let's just say I'm pitching against the Dodgers at, at Shea Stadium, okay? And here comes Steve Garvey up to the plate, and I'm getting ready to throw the first pitch, and I hear, Lynchy, Lynchy, and I'm looking around. It's Keith over at first base. Now there's 52,327 people there. The first base coach is standing there looking at him, I think when I stepped off to look down there at him, Steve Garvey looked, stepped out and looked down there, and Keith looks around like nobody watching and puts his palm down and goes, good high ball hitter, keep the ball down, you know. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Keith, now you just told everybody, the what? fans, the first base coach, now Steve Garvey, I mean, but that's the way he was. He was just such a competitor. He kind of lost where he was, yeah. you know, time-wise and, you know, where, you know, reality wise, he was just so into the game. He just didn't realize what he was doing, but that's the kind of guy he was. He was so into the game and so energetic and so freaking competitive. And, mm-hmm. you know, people toss that word around like it's nothing. He's competitive. Oh, you, you know, he wants to beat you in tiddlywinks and all that crap, you know. But Keith was truly a competitor because competitors, and everybody says, I hate to lose. Well, well, who loves to lose, you know? Right. But but when you lost with Keith as your guy, especially if you should have won the game, it it was a rough. It was rough. I mean, you don't you don't want to you don't want to be in that situation again. So that that was him, and uh, that's that's the story that I have about him, and and just being totally intense and competitive. 
I, I, I love that because yeah. I mean, it, it's so topical because it reminds me of the, the, the tweet that came out last night and this morning about Mike Trout out in center field yeah. gesturing that he was seeing that his pitcher was tipping pitches and he oh, was showing – how yeah. he was tipping, you know, when, when you're throwing the fastball, you're out here. When you're throwing the changeup, you're holding your hands closer. And yeah. he's like, how is this guy not seeing yeah. that? <laughs> that feels like a very but key thing now. That, a very key. And I think I think it's just like you, you brought up before, uh, John, about Jeff Perlman, how, how we had him. And I was just thinking as Ed was explaining and saying the thought process of Keith, and I'm just thinking about thinking about that book and everything that was written about Keith. It's like it, it, it mirrors – everything that was written so clearly it was obviously a well done job by jeff because it was a great book but yeah it's just it's it's clear as day that keith he, i mean and he, look it's probably not the same fire in the booth as it was on the field but we still see that fire from every you know every now and again and we all know that he loves his good fundies so obviously making sure you get that bunt down you better get that bunt down yeah. but yeah, yeah you know i have a hard time fun. watching some of these broadcasters with other teams are such homers i mean it's yeah you know, in our day, I mean, you know, Tim McCarver was rough. You know, if you didn't get, if you didn't, or Ralph Kiner, if you didn't get a bunt down or something like that, they'd rip mm -hmm. you on the air. And and yeah. and you know, when Keith, he doesn't rip you, but he's gonna, you know, what well, are you if doing? Something's up. He'll yeah. say it. Yeah. How could yeah, you? How could you it. think that way? How could yeah. you strike out with a man on third and one out, and the infield's back early in the yes. game? How that should not happen. And he says it about Met players too. Yeah. And mm -hmm. maybe sometimes they don't want to hear it, but you know, who cares? Like you said, Keith and Ronnie, Ronnie's more political, more polished. But I'll tell you what, what a great combination. And Gary Cohn is the best play-by-play -play guy in baseball for me. Absolutely. 100% 100, 100 yes. true. I met them in the booth about a year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to do it, but I, I did because of, because of who they were. And I didn't know if I was going to have the opportunity to, to meet all of them again in one spot. So I asked them, I said, uh, before I go, can I get, uh, an auto, an autograph ball from the best booth in baseball? And without missing a beat, Ronnie goes, I'll be right back. Let me see if the brave guys are busy. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie's got that sense of humor, man. I'll tell and, you. And then, of course, they they signed the ball. They were nice enough to do it, and I got it That's right here. That's great. Prominently one, day, one thing I got to say about Ron Darling. You know, Ron Darling looks like a pretty boy when he came up. You know, all the girls, all the teenage girls loved him. And, boy, I'll tell you what, he was a tough son of a bitch, man. I I, I remember one day we were in Montreal, and he was sick as a dog. And he's laying on the, on the training table, and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a long night. You're going to have to find bullpen to go nine innings. And he said, no, I'm going out there. And, I mean, he literally came in, was throwing up between innings, went out and pitched, you know, not a Ron Darling-esque game, but he pitched mm -hmm. seven and a third, you know, six hits, four runs, four earned, you know, one, one walk, four strikeouts, and we won, you know, eight to four, something like that, you know. I mean, and after the game, he sat there with the writers, not once mentioned the fact that he was sick. And I'm thinking, man, this guy – he looks pretty, but boy, he is some kind of tough. And he was a tough competitor. And he went from being a – when he came up to the big leagues, he threw 100 miles an hour with his hard breaking ball. And by the time he finished in Oakland, he's throwing splits with change-ups and, and, you know, being very productive doing it. Mm -hmm. So he went from one end of the spectrum to the other. How many power pitchers can go and become that kind of pitcher late in their career? So I have all the respect in the world for him, not only as a – as a competitor, but as a, as a pitcher, a guy that knows how to pitch. Uh, ab absolutely fantastic stuff. Yeah. Ed, thank you. Thank you so much. For thank doing you the so show. much. I, I, I hope that you had fun. It sounds like you had a good time. We had a blast having you on. Uh, oh, this really is a blast. It. I love it. So, <laughs> beautiful. Thank, thank you so much. And look, if, if, if you're, if you're into it, we'll, we'll have you on again sometime and, you know, talk more Mets baseball, maybe even after, uh, you know, after old timers day, after the, uh, after Keith's day and everything, we can kind of reflect back on it in the off season or something like yeah, that. Yeah. As we get close, close to the playoffs, I'd like to talk about the playoffs and sure. Anytime. Love to come on with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ed. Okay, Ladies and gentlemen, this has been an episode. You know where to find us. Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, all of those places, wherever else. You can find us on YouTube. Episodes drop every Thursday, all courtesy of the Chop Sports Network. John Sapinaro, Matt Ibi Ibanez, Till Mets do his part. And our guest this week, the one and only Ed Lynch. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. Adios.